Well, it was gonna happen at some point, wasn't it? I was hoping it wasn't gonna be today. Yesterday, I went for a bike ride and largely, I had a wonderful time and I had every intention of filming the next stills in motion video about uh, camera settings, of all things. Sadly, I fell off my bike. Twice. I'm fine and, and so is my bike. Covered in mud, but apart from that, absolutely fine. But I did scare myself a little bit. A lot. And I ended up thinking, is it that sensible in today's uncertain times for a self-employed person to throw themselves down hills on a mountain bike without that much skill, purely in the hope that they're not gonna break both of their legs? I thought about that a hundred different ways. And each time I came to the conclusion that no, that's, it's not sensible. So yeah, that's annoying. I will keep mountain biking, but I'm gonna have to make sure that I'm careful. I might get a gravel bike as well, if I can convince Emily that that's a, a good idea. Uh, but yesterday wasn't a complete waste of time. I managed to help a lady get some scuba diving equipment in the back of a car. Yeah, of course. Yeah, no worries. Okay, we're just going to put it flat. Okay. So maybe we just kind of lift it from here. Yeah, sure. Awesome. Oh, thank you very much. Brilliant. Is that okay? Perfect. You saved okay. the day. No worries. <laughs> Right, so given I failed filming this video yesterday and it was dark by the time I managed to limp back to the car, I thought I'd do it today in here. I've managed to avoid making a video indoors for quite some time now, but we're back. Right, so camera settings. Now, every time I upload a video on this channel that includes one of my photos or loads of my photos, people ask if I can include the settings for those photos alongside the photos. I don't do it for a couple of reasons. First is that I am a terrible video editor and as much as I appreciate you tuning in to these videos for, I don't know, 10 minutes at a time, it takes me probably pff, five hours on average to edit them. And uh, can you imagine having to look at this for five hours? It doesn't bear thinking about, does it? And it's actually quite a time consuming process trying to add the data for each photo. And um, that would add a lot of time having to edit which I do not fancy. The second, a much less stupid reason as to why I don't include the data though, is that I actually don't think it's all that helpful to see the data, the settings, for a particular photo in a particular place at a particular time in a particular location. I don't really see how that could help you all that much. In fact, I think it could send you on a wild goose chase thinking that you need to try and understand something from settings and reverse engineer how that impacted the photo. And I think a lot of the time, it just won't be helpful. And to be honest, I think there are a lot of people making an awful lot of money out of making photography seem much more complicated than it is. And I think at least in part, that's due to the fact that as photographers, we're not perhaps quite as responsible for the end product of our art as other kinds of artists. That needs an example. Um, watercolorists. So imagine you were to march up a hill with an easel and a big piece of paper and some paintbrushes and your paints and you would spend eight hours at the top of this hill painting a landscape. I reckon at the end of that day you could pat yourself on the back and say that you were responsible for whatever art you managed to create. I mean the paintbrush manufacturers might might end up with some of the praise and the paints and largely it's your responsibility. You've done a great job of painting a landscape. But as photographers, I mean, we've got to be honest, the camera does a lot of the heavy lifting. And yeah, we decide where to put it. We twiddle some knobs and we press a couple of buttons. But ultimately, the camera is capable pretty much of its own volition of making decent photos. And so I think sometimes there's a bit of a disconnect between the photographer and their art because they maybe don't feel as responsible for it as they would like to. Which leads to people like me using manual settings, or at least semi-manual settings, or semi-auto settings, whatever they're called, uh, a lot more than I probably need to. I reckon for my personal photography, I could get away with using auto more than half of the time without too many problems, I reckon. I never do, because I want to feel more part of the process. And I thought today it'd be more useful to talk you through those settings that I use and how I come up with them than, um, than show you settings for random photos that I, I don't think will help at all. Right then, so here she is, 
the G9. This is the uh, the camera that I use the vast majority of the time, as you'll know if you watch many of these videos. And the vast majority of time with this camera, I'm shooting in aperture priority mode, even when my aperture is not my priority. So when I'm in aperture priority mode, the first thing I do typically is change the exposure. Well, I assess the exposure. It doesn't always need changing, but I assess the exposure. And if it does need changing, then I change it. I do that by this back wheel here on the G9. I've got that set to change exposure. And when I'm changing exposure in aperture priority mode, what I'm actually doing is changing the shutter speed. So even though I'm in aperture priority, the first thing I'm doing is, is changing the shutter speed. But the reason that I'm doing that is to make sure that I've got an exposure I'm happy with, because regardless of any other settings, if my exposure is not right, then chances are I'm not really gonna like the photo. Uh, then, when I've got an exposure that I'm happy with, I'll assess the aperture. Now, typically, I shoot between f4 and f8 on micro four thirds bodies. I'm not the sort of photographer that typically wants everything in the frame in focus. Uh, I also don't shoot loads and loads of really shallow depth of field stuff. So f4 to f8 works pretty well for me, which is great on the basis that most lenses perform best somewhere in that range. I mean, to be honest, given that we're all stuck indoors, you could, um, you could test where your lenses perform best in terms of aperture, but I mean, you're probably better off just going on any detailed review of that lens to to find out that information. Go ahead by all means and, and test it yourself though if you want. I mean, what else are we gonna do for the next few months? So once I've got an aperture somewhere between F4 and F8, I mean, it's not strictly always between F4 and F8, but once I've got an aperture I'm happy with based purely solely on depth of field, then I need to take a look at shutter speed. So let's say for example, and uh, we'll need to use our imaginations here on the basis that I'm sat in my office and I'm not on a hill. But let's say I'm looking at a hill and there's a lovely little country lane at the bottom of the hill and there's a car coming along that country lane and I want to freeze that car in the action. I'm at f5.6 and my shutter speed is a 50th of a second and I think purely based on experience that to freeze that car in its current speed I'm going to need at least a hundredth of a second shutter speed. Well in that case I've got a decision to make. Either I can brighten my aperture, which will let more light into the camera, and therefore I'll be able to quicken my shutter speed, or I'll need to increase my ISO to increase the sensitivity, meaning that I don't need to change my aperture, but I will still be able to use a faster shutter speed. And it's this shutter speed, the third setting that I consider in this uh, process, that I end up having most arguments with myself about, and missing most shots because of because I can't decide in my head whether I want to change the aperture or raise the ISO. Cost me a lot of shots, that. Now, I should just say very quickly that this is the process I use most of the time, but I did a video on how to take photos quickly uh, that I'll link up here because I use a custom profile when I'm in a scene where I think my subject is moving or things are gonna change quickly. Now, I explain it all in that video, but yeah, most of the time I do this and sometimes I do something slightly different. But anyway, once I've determined the shutter speed I need and how I'm gonna to get to that shutter speed, i.e. changing the aperture or the ISO, then it's really just a case of, um, well, taking the photo. Now, luckily for me, I don't take that many photos with things that are moving particularly quickly in the frame. I mean, sometimes I do, but the vast majority of the time I'm taking photos of things that are relatively still. And given that this camera has got such incredible stabilization, well, it means I don't have to worry about me moving. Even if I've had loads of coffee, I can generally get a sharp shot with this because of the incredible stabilization. I reckon at normal focal lengths, I can get a shutter speed, sharp shots, consistently at a quarter or half a second which is ridiculous, would have been considered bonkers even just a few years ago, but it is mad. The stabilization in both the body and the lenses that work together, mwah. Uh, but yeah, it's as simple as that basically. So in summary, I'm in aperture priority mode, I make sure that I've got the right exposure, then I select an aperture, and then I assess whether I can get a shutter speed that I'm happy with or that's gonna render me a sharp shot, based on the aperture that I've chosen. And if not, I might need to change the aperture. If I don't want to change the aperture, then I'll have to raise the ISO. That, generally speaking, is the process that I go through, the thought process for most of the photos I take. And for most of those, I could just get the camera to do it, to be honest. Um, anyway, hopefully that was useful. Hopefully it simplified the process of choosing your, um, 
your settings a little bit, and uh, I'll see you next time. This room hasn't changed, as you can see, from uh, when I was last making videos in here. I mean, it was only about five weeks ago, I think. I mean, yeah, we've had five episodes of Stills in Motion, so about that. Obviously, it wouldn't have changed that much. Emily did get me another fern. I'll say another fern. This is my first fern, which is a bit greener than my bonsai tree. Check it out compared to my bonsai. Bonsai's looking a bit worse for wear again. But this, I'll just have to try not to wreck this. Also, good news on the book. Thank you so much for your support with, uh, with this book, my second book. I am at the next stage from when I last told you about it. So um, I've done the second draft and I'm just waiting to get that in the post so I can check that it's absolutely perfect. And when that's done, hopefully it is perfect, I'll be able to do the big order, then they'll come to me and then I'll be able to start shipping them to you. So we're on course for them to be before May, actually. But things can go wrong, things can happen. I don't know how the printers is gonna be affected by this virus thing, so. Um, Fingers crossed, I'll keep you updated. Thank you so much for your support. It really helps, particularly at a time like this where the economy is just If any of you are self-employed, freelancers, creative, whatever, to be honest, whatever you do for a living, I hope you're not too, too badly affected by, um, well, the next few months. Right, thank you very much for watching. Uh, I'll see you next time. And if you've got any tips on how to get your confidence back mountain biking after a big crash or two, do let me know. And if you've got opinions on uh, whether you think gravel bikes are stupid or the best thing in the world, that'd be interesting to hear too. Cheers.